Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I trust you enjoyed the discussion uh, and the company of your international colleagues today. Uh, we're now going to switch things up a little bit uh, with this next session. Uh, rather than formal presentations, we are simply going to have a conversation uh, with two great Canadian leaders, uh, McMaster's Chancellor, Linton Red Wilson, and the Right Honourable Paul Martin, uh, Canada's former Prime Minister. Now, I should start by saying how fortunate we are uh, to have them both join us and to lend their voices to our conversation today. Uh, I know that their insights will, begin, will bring a different kind of perspective to the dialogue, uh, tapping, as it will, into their diverse business and political backgrounds, and also into their collective commitment to give our students from all walks of life, the next generation of leaders, that is, the tools needed to ensure that our nations remain prosperous. So some words of introduction. Red Wilson has enjoyed a remarkable business career, taking the helm of a number of companies. Uh, we like to think his success has as much to do with his McMaster degree as it does his business acumen. The list is long. Uh, Red has been the president and CEO of Red Path Industries, vice chairman of the Bank of Nova Scotia, president, CEO, and then chairman of BCE Inc., and chairman of Nortel Networks. He was also a deputy minister of industry and tourism, chairman of the federal government's recent competition policy review panel, and is a member of the Prime Minister's Advisory Committee on the Public Service. He is currently chairman of CAE Inc. and McMaster's Chancellor, where he tirelessly volunteers his time and lends his reputation to the ongoing needs of our university community, both our research enterprise and our student body. Red is an officer of the Order of Canada, a companion of the Business Hall of Fame, and is the recipient of honorary degrees from six Canadian universities. In all of this, he is a great guy, an agreeable person to sit on the stage with at convocation, and a very generous philanthropist. The Right Honourable Paul Martin, Canada's 21st Prime Minister from 2003 to 2006, was the country's Minister of Finance from 1993 until 2002, during which time he erased Canada's debt, introduced the largest tax cuts, and injected the largest increases in the federal government's support for education and research and development. Currently, he is the co-chair of a $200 million British-Norwegian Poverty and Sustainable Development Fund for the ten-nation Congo Basin Rainforest. His passion for international development and prosperity has led to his roles on the Advisory Council of the Coalition for Dialogue on Africa, the UN Economic Commission for Africa, and the African Development Bank. At home in Canada, he is responsible for two major initiatives, the Martin Aboriginal Education Initiative, whose goal is to reduce the high school dropout rate of Canada's Aboriginal youth, and the Capital for Aboriginal Prosperity and Entrepreneurship Fund, which helped to establish and grow successful Aboriginal business both on and off the reserve. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guests. In starting the discussion, uh, I think it's important for you to know about uh, Mr. Martin's role as the architect of the G20, the group of 20 finance ministers and central bank governors which he, along with his U.S. counterpart, established in 1999 to engage major new economic powers that arrived on the world stage in recent years. And I'm going to start the ball rolling today by asking Mr. Martin to talk to us a little about the origins of the G20, what it was that he sought to achieve, and what uh, it went on to become. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dean. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me say how pleased I am to be here. Although I must say, Red, that coming in at the tail end of what is a very, was a very successful panel, uh, opposite, uh, gives one pause for thought. If I understand what Dr. Lava said when he closed that panel, he said this has been a very successful panel. And I regret very much that we're now going to hear from Paul Martin. And <laughs> so, <laughs> so with that as an introduction instead of yours, Patrick, um, 
the, uh, well, my answer here in terms of obviously the foundation of the G20, its creation, has more to do with international financial matters than it does to do with research and development. But what essentially happened is that in 1994, Canada, having not yet dealt with its deficit, was skated offside by what was then one of the major financial crises of the, of the decade, the Mexican uh, financial crisis, the peso crisis, otherwise known as the tequila crisis, which sent our interest rates going through the roof because of the state of our financial condition. I went to the other G7 finance ministers at that time and said, look, this is crazy for the seven of us to think that we're going to be able to govern the world's financial situation when countries like China and India and the emerging economies were playing an increasingly important role as nuts. Uh, I didn't get anywhere. Um, and essentially, um, the, pe the peso crisis was solved quickly. But two years later, when the Asian crisis occurred, which some of you may well remember, was essentially a massive run on the banks of, in of Indonesia, the, the Philippines, uh, Korea especially. Um, I again went back uh, to the G7. I spoke to Larry Summers, who had just been appointed U.S. Treasurer, and said, look, again, that the G7 finance ministers think, think they can deal with this isn't going to work. We laid out a solution for these countries. They told us to go to hell, to be quite honest. They said, we're not at the table, um, and you're coming up with solutions, and the Washington consensus is not going to work, and that the G7 is no longer going to dominate what we do. At that point, the suggestion that we create a parallel organization involving China and India and these countries essentially was ex accepted. I was named the inaugural chair, and the G20 finance ministers then continued. When I became prime minister, um, uh, the reasoning which said you're not going to be able to deal with globalization without China, India, Brazil, South Africa, and the other resurgent economies at the table held forth. And I felt that there were a number of issues, far beyond the financial issues, that had to be dealt with. Um, there was some trouble. Uh, the Japanese were not keen to share power with the Chinese. Uh, all of the jealousies of various countries, and it took a long time for the pressures to build up, but clearly the current financial crisis in 2008, which began in 2008, led the one person who was really against, or certainly the most ambivalent about the G20 at the leader's level, George Bush, to convene, as you know, the meeting in Washington, which then was very successful, led to the most successful meeting, the London summit, when the G20 countries decided on financial matters uh, that they would uh, uh, essentially coordinate their activities. The Pittsburgh meeting, which followed, uh, in which Barack Obama said that the G20 um, uh, was to be the prime economic forum uh, for the world. In my opinion, it was, however, the last meeting, the Korean meeting, which is the one that really said that the G20 came of age and would be of the most interest to many of the people in this room, because it, it was not only was Korea the first Chinese, uh, the first uh, Asian country to chair a G20 summit, but in Korea said that the issue was development and anything else that was of global importance. And so it was at that point that the G20 was given the go-ahead to go beyond the financial crisis. And we'll see how it, it, it handles itself at the French meeting, which is to be held in November, and the Mexican meeting, which will be held next June, whether in fact they pick up on the Korean challenge. There we are. Just thinking for a moment about the G20 and its, its typical agenda. Is my microphone on for anybody here? It's supposed to be a green light for red. I found red after I was no longer Prime Minister, they shut my mic off a lot too. <laughs> I'm just over in this place here, so I'm, I'm not sure where I go. But the G20, uh, I thought, was an important initiative for, for international cooperation, collaboration uh, among a broader group of companies, countries than, than the old G78. But how would, how would a subject like uh, collaboration in research and development uh, fit in with the with G20 uh, format and kind of agenda. Uh, each of the G20 countries 
as a slightly different, or maybe more than slightly different way of, of organizing collaboration between business, universities, governments, not-for-profits, and so on. Uh, each has a slightly or greater than slightly different view about how directional industrial strategy or strategy relating to any particular aspect of the economy ought to take place. Um, how might uh, the G20, therefore, deal with a subject like international cooperation and collaboration on research and development? Well, I think, first of all, to be brutally frank, given the, the, the absolute mess in Europe and uh, the real problems that exist within the United States, um, I think that it's pretty clear that the, the next G20 meeting, the one to be held in France, will focus primarily on financial matters. Um, and I suspect that the Mexican meeting uh, will, will, will as well. But if, if the question really is, look, how do, how do universities, how does research and development play, and is there a role? In my opinion, there is a very important role to play. And I think that, but it, and one of the things I think that universities are going to have to think about is the strategy by what, whereby they put it on the table. My suggestion, I guess, would be uh, as follows. Um, the first thing is I don't think the universities should emulate the business community. The business community, the way that these, these summits now essentially work is that the leaders meet um, and they debate whatever there is and normally there are, there are 20 businessmen, the leading so-called businessmen or women uh, from a country come and meet. They have a separate meeting, a separate summit of these business people who then uh, present uh, to the leaders. Um, it has been my experience, having attended a number of these, that that doesn't work. Uh, that, uh, that essentially leaders want to talk to leaders because they, their deals they've got to cut with them. The bureaucrats, the Sherpas who give the, the advice to the leaders want to talk to the Sherpas and the bureaucrats from the other countries because there's a very strong network. Um, the business people really don't want to talk to the leaders and the leaders sure as hell don't want to talk to the business people. Um, and so it really, it doesn't, it, it doesn't penetrate. A little report is given to the leaders, it's put into the communique and nobody pays any, uh, any attention to it. My, my advice for the universities, if to play, and I think it's a very important one in terms of research and research and development, is that they take into account uh, the first thing that they should do is deal with their governments. Um, that, that they, the, 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 the power of dealing with your own government in terms of your own agenda so that your agenda is part of the national agenda is what's going to put it on the, uh, on, on the table. The second thing is to deal with the, the Sherpas. The Sherpas are the bureaucrats who are in charge of individual meetings. And the Sherpas are normally appointed for far more than one meeting. So deal with the Sherpa in your own country and get your Sherpa, get the Sherpa of your country to put you on a meeting with the bureaucrats because bureaucrats have institutional memory which leaders don't have. Leaders come and go, as I'm an example. Um, and um, uh, whereas the, the Sherpas and the bureaucrats will. So you can build up that kind of institutional memory uh, which, is, which is required. The third thing that I would say is, to the extent that you can, identify with the G20's existing agendas. So let's just go through. What are they? Well, clearly healthcare. Primarily tropical disease is a major, is a major item which will be growing on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, the agenda of, 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 of the G20. And recognize as well the tropical diseases, which are obviously more concerned to the countries in the tropics, are they are looking to universities to fund, to deal with the research, and they're prepared to fund them. Brazil, as an example, is a major funder of research in the United States, and there's no reason why Canadian universities shouldn't be able to uh, to pick up on that. Uh, clearly, climate change. Um, I, I, the climate change agenda is in little trouble right now. I don't think Durban is going to be a success. I don't think it's going to be a success at the next G20. But I don't think there should be any doubt that climate change is going to be the issue of this century, and that the universities, which are well placed, are going to play, are going to be able to get tremendous funding, <laughs> I think, and play out of out of the G20. Energy security and, and energy security, obviously, in terms of renewables, but 
there are other areas. I mean, to simply give you an example, clean coal. Um, coal, everybody is against coal who supports climate change. I, coal's not going to go away. I mean, the, the countries, year 2050, there, of, the, of the 10 most important countries, um, economically, there's not going to be a European country among the list. The first country, obviously, will be China. The second country is going to be the United States. The third will be India. But the thing that we, yet we have to understand is these powerful countries, economically, in the year 2050, massive gross domestic products, are going to be very poor countries. China in 2050 will have a per capita uh, 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 GDP 40% of the United States. India will be 11% of the United States. And they're not going to walk away from coal. And so countries which are enabled to engage in the kinds of technology that will lead to a cleaner climate are going to play a tremendous role. I'll give you another example. The flooding of Delta cities, Bangkok, Thailand, Vancouver. There's going to be a huge role to play within areas such as this. And Canada obviously shouldn't walk away from what is going to be one of the big areas of requiring research, which is, of course, the Arctic. And we are in the process of walking away. We're not doing anywhere near what we should be doing. And to think that the Chinese are going to be doing more is beyond belief to me. So I guess what I would say is that I think there's that universities, <laughs> universities are, and, and, and research and development is going to be a major item on the G20. But in order for it to play and for our universities to play, they're going to have to basically accord with the priorities that those countries are going to be are going to be dealing with. In the, in the business world, we heard earlier today from IBM, SNC about the various ways in which they conduct research and development around the world. Uh, most large multinational companies have not only operations but research and development. Uh, activities in, in major markets uh, around the world. They tend to uh, develop as a result of uh, the success of the companies in those markets with the products that they're, they're selling, uh, with the, uh, the leadership of the companies that are located in those markets, uh, with the talent that is available in those parts of the world, and uh, I guess the cooperation as well of the, of the governments and of course the universities in, uh, in that degree of, uh, of specialization. And specialization is a very important piece in the puzzle for corporations and I think it ought to be as well for universities. Uh, world class is the standard. Uh, there's no sense thinking about simply being a good local player in a particular line of, of research and, and development. Uh, this, is, this, this world is globalizing, globalizing faster than, than, uh, than we can think about it. And so it is a global standard that uh, is going to determine where a lot of activities are going to take place. That means pressure on not just the companies that are actively involved in research and development efforts, the universities, and how they are able to play and attract talent and cooperate in partnerships with, with business and with government. Uh, there is a whole new way of, of interacting here, I guess one might say, uh, that I think is going to be a big determinant of the success of any particular country. Each country has its own view of how it wants to support various activities in research and development. We have in Canada our view, uh, the U.S. does, Brazil does, every other major country does. And, and I think that is also a degree of, of, of competition, if you like. Uh, we uh, recently, in the company I'm involved in, CAE, uh, have repatriated a research operation to Canada, partly because we had the right people in Canada, and partly because the governments in Canada, in our case the Quebec government, as well as the federal government, were very supportive and made it economical for us. The talent was there, as well as the economics of it, and it allowed us as a company to build on a core strength 
and develop a new business activity. That's happening all the time in, in, in corporations that are active around the world. Uh, it isn't a static thing we're dealing with here. It's, it's dynamic. It's very dynamic. And the leadership of universities, of companies, of governments is going to be increasingly tested in terms of this, uh, this globalization phenomenon. Patrick, I don't know whether you have any thoughts about how the universities might uh, compete, if you like, compete well, for yeah. talent, compete for activities. Well, I mean, I think that gets to the heart of a, a fundamental issue here, which is that much of the discussion today has been about collaboration uh, between uh, researchers in different countries, uh, often within individual economies which are in competition with each other. And, and that, to me, is a very interesting balance. Of, I mean, obviously, in the interests of securing real progress on a number of these issues, if you think of the issues that Paul named as the, the, the concerns of the G20, um, progress, in some sense, is likely to be hampered by competition, or perhaps competition will fuel it. I'm not sure. Can I, I, I just pick up on what, what Patrick is saying? I, I hear you, Red, and I, I agree. With, I mean, I certainly, there's no doubt about the importance of corporate research. I mean, it goes without saying. In fact, without it, we're going to be in real trouble. There are, there are, however, you know, a couple of nuances that I would bring to your, to your, your answer. Um, um, the first is, if we're talking in terms of the G20, so take a look at the G20. Um, Indonesia, emerging economy. Um, South Africa, not yet emerging economy. Um, Brazil, emerging economy. These are all countries which have very specific needs, and this is take the one of health. There's a real worry that if, in fact, health research is dominated by the private sector with proprietary rights, with intellectual property, that, in fact, um, major countries in the G20 are not going to get access to the kinds of health uh, care products that they otherwise require. And so while I think it's important that we put a big emphasis on corporate research, if in fact governments and their universities back away from it in order to delegate it to those because of the current recession, I think we would be in real trouble. And you're nodding to say that you, you would agree. That would be one nuance. The second nuance is that um, I really do believe that it is a responsibility of government to, to advance the sum total of human knowledge. Um, the great, the last 500 years compared to the previous 4,500 of cities and this kind of thing, have been one where the sum of human knowledge has constantly increased. And that was not human knowledge designed to sell a product. That was just simply human knowledge for human knowledge's sake. And I think that we will really be failing the generations that follow if, in fact, we do not engage in that kind of research, which I don't think the private sector will be able to afford or will do. It may be an offshoot of what they do, but I think that really has got to be a responsibility of our universities, uh, which are, in fact, certainly in this country, the, major, the greatest instruments we have for that kind of research. And I think that the G20, I think that the G20, once they come out of recession, will we'll pay much more attention to that idea. Do you think the G20, back to that, given its preoccupation in most countries, if not all, of the G20 countries, with budget issues, with financial problems, challenges, uh, do you think this will affect the focus of a lot of these countries or the G20 itself? on things that are important to continue to sustain, uh, whether it's basic knowledge or applied knowledge, uh, is, is this going to crowd out um, activities that we should be focusing on to continue? Absolutely. And, and, uh, uh, and we're seeing it in Europe already. Uh, and I, I would regrettably say that, it, I mean, if, in fact, the, the Americans really deal with their deficit, I think we'll start to see it happening in the United States. I think, I say this with considerable regret, but I think that it's a, 
I, I, I find it, well, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's happening already in Europe. I think, by the way, that this produce, provides Canada with one huge opportunity. Um, look, we've got, a, we've got a, a structural deficit. We have a deficit we have to deal with. Uh, there should be no doubt about that. But we are not in the same situation as all other countries, and it is my own belief that rather than constantly say how good we are and how lucky we are, that we recognize that this is the time to take advantage of it. If our universities at the present time and our governments at the present time are not able to, finan to finance it, this is the time to start, I hate to put it, well, poaching, stealing, whatever you want to talk, the best and the brightest from around the world and giving our own people a real shot at doing it. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that whether you're talking in terms of applied research or I would hope basic research, but economically, a country of 34 million people with the potential possibly to rise to 50 million, um, facing countries of a billion two, uh, at least two, and I mean, and take a look at these populations of Indonesia, uh, Brazil, let alone the United States, we are going to be in very, very tough shape competing with them unless we are really ahead in the knowledge race. And the time for us to pull ahead is right now. Should we open up the floor, President? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure there are many people with, with questions they'd like to, to put to uh, the group. Please, go ahead. Can I just ask for clarification? When you're thinking about that agenda universities have typically pursued, are you, are you thinking terms of the international development agenda that has been well, very much? Sure. I'm just overhead here. Patrick is the <laughs> president of the university. <laughs> well, I would say we definitely do have a major role, perhaps a more important role than, than ever in the past. Uh, uh, today there have been discussions amongst people from a number of different countries about ways in which research in one uni universities in one country can be linked to the work going on in another. And I do think that the universities can, through collaborative research, become an extraordinary force for, for global transformation, both the material conditions of life on the planet and also the distribution of wealth on the planet. So I do think the universities have a key role to play. Uh, I, I think one's optimism about that has to be temp tempered somewhat by, by Mr. Martin's comment that uh, in times as difficult as this economically, uh, more immediate issues may in fact crowd out the activities of the university and the influence of the university in the crafting of the agenda. I, I think the answer again uh, is, is unequivocally uh, that the universities have to play this, that role. I think that all of the great institutions are in the process of changing more and more. The role of government um, is, uh, is obviously it, it, the basic role which government had always had, which is economic security, military security. Um, uh, the funding of its own institutions is going to is going to play, 
But government, more and more, given the interdependence of nations, is going to, national governments are going to have to play a role in making globalization work, which means working with other nations. Um, if within those countries there are not institutions beginning with the universities uh, that are basically going to be pursuing so many of the discussions or so many of the initiatives that government isn't going to be able to deal with and providing the freedom for people to basically deal with those. I don't know who's going to do it. I mean, I think that if anything in the kind of world in which we're going to go, which runs a great risk of sort of stultification or of sort of control, if universities are not able to play a role fighting that kind of thing in the ways in which you've said, whether it's in the humanities or whether it's in basic research, I don't know who's going to do it. And let's not forget about the important role of universities in educating and training people, talent, uh, which is, a, is, is an ever increasingly important uh, competitive factor. Uh, so that particular responsibility of universities, I hope we don't, we don't neclect. Can I, can I, in fact, can, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll squeeze my answer in that, uh, on to your question on the next question, no matter what it is. So what it, the, uh, <laughs> my mother asked you the question? No, no, you. <laughs> uh, just to pick up on what you said, that the opportunity is today, and we heard today a lot of people talking about uh, various complexity of the innovation system, different players, academia, government, uh, business sector. I'm wondering whether um, in, t in terms of facilitate uh, the opportunity for Canada on the global s mar market, the global sector for SMT in particular, do we, need, do we have the right champions or do we need to identify a champions that will help us develop a, a national strategy for innovation in terms of international SMT strategy or is it possible to use existing mechanisms or to try to make them, make them work together? So can, do we have the right organization and the right leadership in terms of organization to set up the stage to take advantage of this opportunity? Or do we need to let government deal with government stuff, let industry deal with industry stuff, and university deals with the R&D aspect? How, do you, how would you see this, uh, the right, how can we take that opportunity and move forward uh, effectively? But isn't it a mixture? I mean, I mean, you've got uh, organizations like SHRC and NSERT, which I think have got a, a very important role to play going ahead, which are essentially part and parcel of government, but, but sufficiently distant from it. Um, you've got the universities, uh, which are more distant from it, which are able to do it. So I, I think, if I understand the question, it's a combination. It, it, is that not the, the answer? I mean, you know, it, part of this is we should ask you some of the questions that we're, you're asking us. Um, you know, I mean, I, I did my undergraduate work in philosophy, I went to law school, so you can, quantum physics and quadratic equations are not my strength. The, uh, in fact, I would, sorry. Go ahead. You know, I, 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 I mean, let me pick up, let me just ask a question and somebody I would hope will, will pick it up. Um, well, let me, let me squeeze in the answer to the last question, and then I'm gonna ask my question. Because <laughs> I've, I've learned that with these two guys, if they get the floor, I'll never get it. The, um, uh, I think that it's vitally important that universities maintain their independence. And I think that's part of the answer to your question. Um, I think that, I, I think you can have national strategies, and, but if those national strategies are rigidly applied by governments, uh, I think that we're, that's, a, a, that's simply a, a very quick exit to the end of the, end of the sewer. I think that you basically got to be able to adjust and you've got to be able to go with somebody's obsession. You've got to be able to deal with the kinds of things that only people within your field can do. That's why when we set up, and I know this is one of the sponsors here, the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Canada Foundation for Innovation was actually created by the Department of Finance. And, and it was created and it was set up in a way that no government could control what it did. It was set up in a way such that the decisions were going to be made by the, by the researchers and the universities who were part and parcel of it because of exactly uh, the issue that you, have, that you have raised. At some point would somebody, so that, that is the answer that I would give to your, to, to, to your question. Um, uh, the question that I would ask though that flows from what you're talking about is how is this going to be done is my biggest worry is that in all of this talk about applied research, we're going to forget about knowledge for knowledge's sake. And I don't think you can leave that to government. 
Uh, I think you, that has to be the independent entities within government, the universities and the researchers. And I guess the question that I would put to you is, in today's climate, is, research, is knowledge for knowledge sake research, the, the independent strikeout of, an, of a researcher, is that still possible? And if it's not, what can we do to make sure it is, if you think it's important? I, I think you should take the, the, the microphone. I think what you're saying is really good. So for those of you who couldn't hear, he just said that, boy, the three of you are brilliant. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'll remember. <laughs> I, just, you know, I think you know, basic research is still possible. I think the, the real thing is, is there's good research and there's bad research. If you want to do good research where it's pure of applied, it's curiosity motivated driven. And if you allow that to happen, things will be fine. And I think a fine example of what's happening in Canada is the Perimeter Institute. There's nothing more than pure research going on in Perimeter Institute, but it's fantastic research, and it's going to spin off down there. Good. Thank you. Just very quickly, <laughs> to add to that, this is the most important question. Uh, you know, this, uh, what well, we call the discovery research versus uh, innovation research or target research. One of the uh, <coughs> downside of globalization is that when the uh, U.S. in particular was promoting this uh, kind of uh, targeted research mostly, the whole world followed. And uh, as a result, uh, and I was discussing this with the, with the president of NSERC today, a great concern is that the amount of funding in Canada going for discovery research has actually been reduced, with the success rate reducing from 90% in some disciplines down to almost uh, you know, 50%. So it's a great concern within universities right now. And I think we need to change that back to the Canadian model. When I discussed this with the president of NSF last year in Toronto, uh, he admitted, and he was leaving his position, he admitted actually that that is a, something that they have realized and they should move back to uh, paying attention to basic research. So I really do appreciate uh, Mr. Martin, many of the comments that you have made, in particular this one. Okay. Oh, thank you. My, um, my name is Randy Zadra. I'm from uh, Carleton University. Uh, my question relates to uh, R&D and trade agreements. Uh, as you know, we have a number of trade agreements currently under negotiation including one very deep and broad trade agreement with the European Commission. The European Commission manages uh, a pot of money that is in the order of $15 billion a year for research and development. The Europeans want to get at the Liquor Control Board, government procurement, and so on. Will we ever see a day, and if we go to the NSF, it's a similar scenario. I mean, I come at it from the uh, assumption that there's never enough money for R&D for uh, the crowd in this room. So would we ever see a day when research and development becomes part of a trade agreement and um, you know, people in this room can actively uh, go after money in Europe or the US on an equal basis because it's part of a trade agreement? Well, first of all, you can, but you can today, right? I mean, you no. Yeah, well, you can go after very, you, you, very small targeted amounts of that 15 billion, for example, would be a very minute amount of the European Commission money that Canadian researchers could go after, unless it's matched by Canadian funding. In, in my experience, uh, take Europe. Each country has its own strategy in dealing with R&D. It's not a European Commission thing. Uh, there may be some monies available at that level. But what the French do to support what they think is important in research, development, uh, is very targeted. So are the Germans, so are the Italians. And each one does it differently. There are different mechanisms and different 
roles and responsibilities, but they each have a way of, of dealing with that. I don't think you're going to get a trade agreement to be able to capture uh, how those countries deal with those kinds of uh, initiatives. That's my nickel's worth. Well, actually, I mean, Red has had a lot more experience in this particular area than I have, so I would, I would, I would buy fully w what he said. The one question I would ask, and maybe I should put it to you, Red, that if that's the case, if there are a areas, I mean, listen, the G20 is going to run this. I mean, the, 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 the economies of the G20 are so powerful that they are going to run all of this. But if the G20 establishes a certain set of priorities, um, for the sake of discussion, uh, renewable energy, just say it. If they establish that, and they then ultimately, I think they're going to come to a point where they will then ask the individual countries to put up a certain amount of money towards a pot, then would, would it not make sense that universities from any of the G20 countries, or the even non-G20 countries, to be honest, would have the right to apply for that, to that oh, pot? Oh, I think so. If it were a yeah. pot on a big issue like that, not something that's more focused on development potential in the near term, but something that's it's a little further out, yeah. So if that's the case, then would it not make sense for Canada to really push for that kind of a concept, just the fact that there are some larger countries out there? Would that make sense for Canada to actually that, we should start putting that forth as part of the G20 agenda? It's like anything else. If our contribution is on a per capita or per GNP kind of basis, we typically benefit from being yeah. part of a larger pot, whether it's, whether it's G20 or any other bigger pot. So yeah, but uh, I think that's, that's not an easy thing to pull off. Uh, it would be interesting to see the kind of discussion with the G20. You'd know a lot more about that, Paul, than I, but how that would be managed to come up with something that's workable, that every country felt they could yeah. access and participate in. Make you deal. I'll handle the G20, and you handle the current government. You get along with them better than I do. <laughs> I'm happy to be overhead at the university. <laughs> can, I, can I just go to the question, though? Because uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but in some ways the question is very thought-provoking in that it looks towards a point at which one might assume that collaboration in R&D was so vitally important across national borders and na national interests self-protective interests that one might think of, of an agreement on collaborative research that would be just as important for the mutual enrichment of the nations as, as a trade agreement would be. So I, 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 re I like that you posed the question in that way because it, it tips the balance a little from the sort of odd relationship between competition and collaboration that we've been negotiating on and off in different sessions today, more in the, in the direction of collaboration. Clearly, the, the question was intended as a follow-up to the rest of the conference because we continuously hear the world is flat, we need to collaborate, yep. there's no borders. So <laughs> what mechanisms do we have to put that in place? And aren't we, Canada, don't we have some key sectors, as uh, Prime Minister Martin said, where we could really play ball in this case? Yeah, I think that's right. I... Yeah. Thank you. My name is uh, Adekun Ajiboye. I'm from uh, McMaster University. And uh, my question is, uh, looking at the Canadian perspective, um, apparently our voice uh, on the world stage is being drowned uh, gradually uh, because of our population, because of the financial uh, strength. What key steps should the government and uh, academia, uh, considering R&D, be taking uh, to, to remain relevant technologically and in research and development, because that appears to be the only way we will remain relevant on the world stage. What, 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 what steps should... What key steps should our government and our, pro, our academia should be taken uh, for Canada to remain relevant on the world stage? Uh, if we're looking at the G7 now, if we look at the G7 without looking at the G7, we are not in the G7 if we look at the largest seven economies. You know, so, what key steps should we be taking, uh, considering a Canadian perspective? I, I'm not sure how I'd begin to answer that, but I, I always need to go back to, to remind myself that what universities can do is what universities exist to do, which is to, to seek knowledge, to seek insight, and to disseminate it. Um, uh, so, time, and again, I think we, we, 
we discover that the best alliances, the best ways in which to achieve large uh, global breakthroughs in research arise from uh, cooperation between researchers at the grassroots level. So I think there are two questions. Uh, one is to increase our capacity to do the kind of research that will be transformative, uh, which we do need to do in partnership with others. But then the, the other question is the political question of how you position the nation. And I think the two, the two questions pull in, in slightly different directions. I'm not sure if you agree. It's a question for a former prime minister. <laughs> Well, that's why he's thinking about it. Uh, he, that's why he's former. The, uh, <laughs> uh, the, I, I, I'm having a little trouble with the question. I mean, the question is, how do you position the country or how do you position universities yeah. in terms of where R&D is going to go? Yes, to, to maintain our influence and in our world. ability to shape the direction well, of the world. Well, I, it seems, I guess, it, se it seems to me that the, the answer is threefold. One, there are areas where, as a country, um, we absolutely have to lead. The Arctic is one of them for obvious reasons. All of this huge agricultural research that's going into wheat uh, is another one where if, if, if we're not prepared to lead in that area, then you've got you've to ask yourself, what are we prepared to, to lead in? Um, the second is, goes back to those areas which are really defined um, as the issues of absolute global concern. Renewable energy certainly is, is, is one of those. And, and if you're not playing a role within that, then you're obviously both economically and in terms of the research the world needs, you're, 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 you're fading um, from the scene. But the third is, I, I don't know how, I think you have to, government has to be directed in certain areas, such as what we have just talked about. But I don't think that the, it's, it's a directive that anybody is going to follow, everybody is going to refuse to follow, which is, Arctic or renewable energy as an example. Um, but the third is, um, and again, I put the question back to all of you, it's got to be, look, you're, use your expression, curiosity-based research, and I don't think the government, I, don't, I really don't think it would be a very happy world if you had government out trying to direct curiosity-based research. I mean, <laughs> in fact, I think it would be a hard thing to find a government that was curious. The, 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 <laughs> well, but, but the, the, the the, the fact of the matter is, I think that there's got to be a healthy part of what government is in the process of, of doing, along with the universities, is allowing curi curiosity-based research to basically play a leading role. And I would have thought that the country that did that is then going to be the country that's one of the most attractive for researchers to come to. Thank you. Yeah, that, that would make sense. My name is Hadi Mahabadi. I was the manager of R&D for 30 years. <clears throat> My question is related to creation of a sense of urgency around innovation. We know those countries in the world who succeed putting innovation on top of the agenda and have a very progressive strategy on innovation. They started by creating sense of urgency around innovation. Some country, they had nowhere to go except going after innovation, and that creates sense of urgency. The example is Ireland or Finland. I believe after Second World War was Japan, and that created a sense of urgency. In Canada, we are in good economic and I believe we are not facing such a sense of urgency and hopefully we will not face any crisis. How can we use the wealth and a good condi economic condition but creating, equity, creating a sense of urgency for innovation? Uh, you may have noticed that the President of the United States is leading the charge on innovation, jobs, innovation. Uh, he is out front on this issue. Uh, it comes from, obviously, the concerns that exist in the U.S. for the performance of the economy. But here you have the President of the United States as the person who's saying innovation is important. 
we haven't had that in Canada. We haven't had that at, at the same kind of level. Uh, there have been lots of recent uh, writings and articles and discussions about our performance and productivity, research and development, innovation, and it's basically us talking to ourselves, those of us that, that are involved in one way or another in those activities. I think there is a need, personally, and I'm not a political person, but I believe there is a need for some political leadership on that issue. And it does encompass not just what business is going to achieve, but also the other partners in the process of, of wealth creation, including universities, including government. Uh, but it is, it is something that requires some leadership, in my view, at the national level. Let me ask you, Red, I, 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 and you have, I mean, Red Wilson has been one of the people who has historically spoken out very strongly on this. The, it, the sp probably, if not the, the greatest, certainly one of the most important social issues that we face today is the unemployment rate among 18 to 24 year olds. Um, I mean, we all, we all, every, all of us were shocked by the Spanish numbers, 45% of people in that age <coughs> limit are being unemployed. But we have it massively here in, in, in Canada. And the answer to that, certainly partially, I mean, we all talk glibly about its education. Well, a lot of those 18 to 24 year olds are, 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 are educated. So it's, and the answer is all innovation. It is innovation. The, the real question is, and I think your answer is right, but how do we do it? My nickel's worth on this. Innovation is not just the creation of new products or new, new things out of the box. Innovation takes a lot of forms in, in the business world, which leads to the creation of jobs. Sometimes it's, it's process engineering, research and development applied to figuring out how you produce something cheaper, more competitively, to be able to sell more competitively. Sometimes it has to do with, with the way the company is marketing its activities. Steve Jobs is a terrific marketer. He's also done some great work in terms of Apple's product market. But he is, uh, he's certainly the guy who's out there leading the charge and creating a buzz about what he's doing. And they can't wait for the next Apple announcement. That's innovation as well. Organizational activities, organizational uh, change within business. That's another piece that requires innovation. All of this is to try and hopefully produce firms, small, medium, large, that are more competitive and employ more people, that are growing and not declining, that are actually out there looking for young talent to, to allow them to continue on and do what they're doing. This is a global world, and I think that's another piece in the puzzle that universities can play an important role, and that's educating uh, students as they're growing up about what is going on in the world around us. The world around us is not Hamilton, Ontario. It's not just Canada. There's a lot going on that we will have to compete in that bigger world, and our success will depend on the next generation of leadership and how it's able to cope with the global environment in which business and people are going to operate. So I, I think it's a, it's a very broad question, but we do need some initiative here, in my view, at, at a leadership level that begins to focus some of the, the how-to, Paul, uh, which, which I think is an important question. How do we raise productivity? How do we uh, Keep, allow people or encourage people to start new businesses? Do we just throw money at it? Or is it a matter of, of, of trying to guide and be helpful and mentor and all of that? It's, it's, not a, it's not a question that you can answer as simply as, as that, but it starts with leadership. In that. Hi, my name is Eric. I'm a postdoc in McMaster. Um, hopefully I can bring a bit of the younger person's perspective. People talking. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, uh, 
the population is growing by 2050 something, there will be 9 billion people, and our planet literally cannot support that many people at the quality of life that's enjoyed by the people sitting in this room. Um, so there are various pathways by which I see we could go. One is collapse. We use up all our natural resources, and then we all die off. The second is a control of the lower classes by banking procedures and tools like the G20 and the military industrial complex. Uh, we know that the US spends a thousand times more on its military than on research and development in other aspects of life. So uh, the third way that in my more optimistic days I see as a path is innovation. And um, so my, my question to you is how do we choose that third path and not go towards uh, a, a collapse or a, or a military police state? Well, I think the answer, the answer is, is political will. And if you take a look at the two, take, take the two most graphic examples, I think that there's no doubt that at $9 billion we cannot feed the world. I don't think, I think everybody is pretty confident that given the quality of agricultural research, given the problems of storage, distribution, that we're going to handle that problem. As I mentioned, I spend a lot of time in Africa, and I'm, I think that in terms of agricultural production, the innovation that is required to make sure that we can feed 9 billion people um, is going to be, uh, can be handled. In fact, I think that there's a pretty strong view that, that the problem with agricultural production is not agricultural production, it's war in terms of famine. I don't think it's the same answer in terms of energy. I think that we really recognize that climate change, renew the need for renewable energy, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the problem with the, the, the natural, declining natural resources, the inability to deal with natural resources that can provide it but that are polluting is a huge problem which society is just simply refusing to address. And I, I think that the answer to that question is at some point, uh, at some point, uh, you know, the panic's going to hit. And I, I suspected it would have hit if it hadn't been for the financial crisis. But there, there's the problem. I mean, you take a look, I guarantee you that they will not deal with climate change in and, and, and France and they will not deal with it in Mexico, which is the next two G20 meetings. It's political will. It's political will. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Vidal from the Public Policy Forum. And uh, we've heard some discussion here today about uh, the necessity of a global brand and the fact that when it comes to innovation, Canada really lacks a global brand. People don't have uh, anything that resonates about Canada when it comes to innovation. So I wanted to ask each of you um, if you can imagine five or ten years forward uh, and we had a firm and accepted and well-known global brand. From your perspective, uh, what would it look like? How would it sound? It's an easy question, Paul. Over to you. I, <laughs> <laughs> was Kevin Lynch here this morning? Yes, he was. And I'm sure he talked about it. Did he branding. talk about it? It's, yeah. It started with him, but many other people have, have referenced it through the, through the day. So. You coming to me? <laughs> and I should say that Kevin said that our brand was that we're nice. So yeah, I think that, and I, I mean, yeah, Kevin was my deputy minister, and uh, uh, we, we had this discussion, and I, I mean, I think he's right. I mean, I think that the, uh, but that's what I, uh, that's why I come back to what I said earlier about that, that this situation in which the Europeans and the, the Americans are caught with the need to face up the massive deficits, there is austerity that is going to hurt. And I tell, I mean, I, I know this one. I, you know, we went through it in 1995. We cut research and development. It was, I mean, we had to do it. I do it again, but it was a. It, this country paid a price for that, um, and they're going to they're going to pay it. I mean, I think that if we at this, if we take advantage of now, of what, that so much the developed countries are now going through this kind of austerity, and it opens a door to us. That it, and it also opened the door to us to make all kinds of deals with the resurgent economies, with China and India as an example, working in collaboration with them in areas that they require, um, using their lower cost base and our skills base uh, to match their skills base, which is, is, is really great. I think it would give us a phenomenal opportunity. And I think that, to be quite honest, and the one disagreement I had with, with Kevin a little bit is that we're not going to create a brand and market unless the brand is, is valid, unless it's really rooted in something that's very, very real. But I think if we follow that kind of a course, uh, then I think that we've got a real shot at it over the course of the next decade. 
But if we just simply say we're no different than Greece and we've got to cut all over the place, well, then we're not going to make it. I can, I can take a run at this. So, I mean, if you ask, if you ask a, an academic from the humanities this question, you'll get the kind of answer you're about to get. I mean, if, I, if I were to say what our brand should be in 10, 20 years uh, on this front, innovation, development, I would say the brand needs to be bold, creative, aggressively creative in service to a deep and profound humanity. That's what I would say. It's a more... Uh, this is the first time I've ever found myself on the left side of the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, you know, we are, we are known in the world. We, it's not true that we don't have any recognition of what, can, what Canada is, what Canada stands for, and what, what our brand in that sense is. Yeah, we don't have the presence that America does, for sure. And yes, maybe we're late at getting involved in, in places like China or India, where people are not sure who we are and where we're coming from. So I believe we have to do things in order to create a brand. I don't think you can go to whoever the current gurus in, in merchandising and marketing are and say, design us a brand and we'll wear it on our backs all over the world. I think we, we're going to be known for what we actually do, what we deliver. At the moment, we're seen actually in very positive terms in the financial side of things, in the financial world. Canada is seen as a, as a country that managed its financial affairs prudently, perhaps a little conservatively, uh, which we do. But nevertheless, here we are now, uh, much better shape than folks on Wall Street and in Europe, for sure. So, you know, we're not without, without attributes that people are aware of. And I think we need to keep working at being successful in all those things that we do. That will be our brand. I talked about, I say we managed our financial affairs prudently. The, um, but uh, <laughs> as opposed to conservatively, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I, you and I agree. I just think, I think you said it better than I did. You should have been a politician. <laughs> Can I say, since I, I know it's my job to make sure we keep on time here, so these will be our last two questioners. Please go ahead. Hello, I'm Alison Papuisa, and I'm with the Ontario government. And we've heard today some discussion about a tension between competition and collaboration. But I'm wondering if maybe those labels, uh, the ways that we think about it, are, are too simple. So, for example, we know from the survey of innovation that a lot of business ideas come from clients or competitors. We have this movement in the states towards open innovation. And also a number of the really important world examples given earlier, nobody wants a loser. No one wants a loser on climate change. No one wants a loser on economic stability. So if, if the sporting analogy might be uh, less about a game of tennis or soccer where you've got winners and losers and opponents, and more of one where you think of skiing alongside someone and, and them having a great run doesn't detract from your run in any way. So my question is this, you know, in, in this millennium and, and for this audience, do we still need to have opponents? Do we, st do we still need to have opponents? Do we still need to have people we're actively competing against? Uh, I believe we do. I believe competition is an important driving force in innovation. You'll see an article in this month's policy, or this uh, issue of Policy Options, written by Tom Jenkins, uh, where he says, in effect, competition is the thing that drives innovation. It's our productivity, whatever you want to call it. But I don't believe a love-in is the way that we're going to make yards. I believe we do need to have something to compete with to strive to be better than. And if we don't, uh, lots of other people are out there are gonna do that. Yeah, I, I think that the, I think that the, the, um, the rewards of competition, of successful competition, are that you are able to make the world better for everyone. So that the rewards of competition 
uh, should not only be spent within your own country. They should be elevating uh, the quality of life and the ability ultimately to compete of those parts of the world which are not able to compete. In our time, it's Africa, Central America being an example. But I don't think, it, it, it may well, this may be all be a philosophic uh, uh, debate, but I agree with Red in terms of the, the reality. I think that what we are in competition as to whether we are going to be able to provide the high quality jobs for our 18 to 24 year olds ongoing. I think that is the big social issue for virtually every country. Um, and I think that you're, you see the cost of not, meaning, uh, of not being able to satisfy that. And I, I hate to say it, but I think that is competition. And I, I don't know any other way around it uh, than to say it that way. Patrick? It's, it's an interesting and very challenging question. I mean, I, I would say that my answer is, I like your analogy of the two people skiing down the hill at the same time, and there's a sort of frisson in that, and there's pleasure and success and so on. Uh, I, I think I probably would accept the notion that uh, competition is important, but it has to be a, a higher form of competition in my view. And I, I think if we make great progress in science and technology, but no progress on human values, uh, we will be doomed anyway. So I think if, if one's thinking about where to go on R&D, one needs to be maintaining an equally rigorous dialogue with ourselves about what the values are in the name of which we should be acting. Hello, my name is Hannah Genesee. I'm the president of WISE, the Women in Science and Engineering at the University of Toronto. If any of you would want to work with us or sponsor us, I'll be there at the reception afterwards. But my question is that, the mindset of Canada's next generation will, of course, determine the level of excellence that we as a nation reach on a global level of research and development. So how would each of you define the mindset that your generation needs to foster in my generation, of the mindset of students that they need to develop to be Canadian leaders in innovation on a global stage, and especially focusing on the female population of the professional students? I'm not sure I understand the question. No, I couldn't hear it, actually. <laughs> You spoke a little quickly for, for, my for our age. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm from the University of Toronto. Is that better? Yes, I heard that. Okay. <laughs> from Wise, <laughs> Women in Science and Engineering. And my question was how would you define the mindset that my generation needs to have to be leaders on a global stage in research and development, and especially focusing on the mindset that? women who are in a professional role need to have to be players on a global level and to gain the respect that they need? Uh, we spoke to this in the competition policy panel report, uh, which you may or may not have seen. And we talked about the need for the next generation of Canadians to skate harder, shoot harder, and keep your elbows up in the corners, which which is what is required, I think, in terms of the mindset. It's, I'm not talking about whether or not your elbows are too high or you're, you know, you're giving, delivering headshots, but the, it's the competitive mindset that says that, hey, we're going to achieve something, whatever it is, whether it's in basic research, uh, human values, university, education, uh, but in whatever it is, we got to have a mindset that says, hey, we're going we're gonna to do it the best. We're going to be the winners. And, and it's that which I think is, is, is important for the next generation to, uh, to carry forward. So I've tried this on my grandson, who's uh, 12 years old and playing hockey up in Sudbury. And uh, he's not sure that he's ready to have his elbows up in the corners yet. But he is working at shooting harder and skating harder. Um, I don't think there's any, again, um, you know, again, I, I, I agree with, with Red. I must say, Red, you have improved substantially. The, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the yeah. <laughs> it was my association with you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I, I think there's no doubt. I mean, I think that the whole, the, the, the competition uh, is, as we've already discussed, 
but I, I don't think I think there are huge changes, and I think that you represent those changes. I, um, just to demonstrate what I mean, the, the company with which I was involved, and um, my, how my sons are involved, Canada Steamship Lines, is essentially um, the ship is a box. That's all it is. It carries carries stuff. Uh, Canada Steamship Lines is a niche market. It basically is materials handling, so it unload loads and unloads itself. So it's and it's a constantly evolving technology um, that was developed on the Great Lakes and the, the company is now bigger, way bigger outside of Canada than it is within Canada. Um, I was away from the company for pretty well all of the time that I, well, for all the time I was in public life and I've stayed away because my kids have said it's doing well, please don't come back. Um, <laughs> I am, was absolutely amazed to find out the other day, two thir they've, they've got an extensive engineering staff two-thirds of the engineering. When I left the company, there was not one woman on the staff. Two-thirds of the engineering staff today are women. Um, and I, this is not a, I don't believe, I may be wrong, I don't believe this is a company that sought to open up its doors. I think what they went out, they went out and hired the best that they could possibly get, and the best happened to be, uh, happened to be women. So I think that's a fundamental, obviously a fundamental change that I think is gonna benefit this country very, very much. Um, and I suspect it's a change that's happening in companies elsewhere, um, all, all, all over the place. Um, to a certain extent, though, I, I, if I could just maybe close by picking up on something that Patrick said, I don't think that, that competition is at odds with sound values. I don't think at all. I think that competition uh, is what drives us all. It's what drives researchers to be the first to discover this. It, it's what drives us all to succeed in business. It's, what's, it's what makes in, in the arts and in the humanities people want to be the very best that they can. Uh, but I do think that the, the, the answer that Patrick gave is, is probably one of the most fundamental ones, is the values that you hold when you do it. I think as a country we have a phenomenal opportunity, not just because of our financial situation, but because of our geographic, because of our natural resources, which if we don't blow them, but we actually you know, spend our, use that to build a, a different kind of economy, because of the different kind of economy that we are in the process of building. But, and, and this would take us down a very different path, and I don't want to, we're at the end. But, you know, I mean, I, just, I spend now most of my time, apart from Africa, on the Aboriginal issue in this country, all right? It is impossible for me to say that we in Canada exercise the kinds of values that we say we exercise when you take a look at the way we treat Aboriginal Canadians. We underfund their education, we underfund their health care, we are indifferent to, 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 their, uh, to what they go through. So I think this is a much broader, broader issue than simply research and development or even competition. It is what do you truly, do you, do you stand for the values you say you stand for? And I think that there are areas in Canton, this country, where we don't. And I think that the responsibility for that lies partially with government, substantially with universities, substantially with those, with those who educate each other. And you know, I think ultimately it's going to rely on your generation to do a better job in some of these areas than we have done. So uh, I'm going to allow myself some, some gross generalizations. Uh, your, your question fortunately invites me to do that. Um, I, so I've, I've been in the business of educating undergraduates for 30 years. Um, my observation over time is that they've gone from thinking the way I recall my own generation thought about the intellectual issues we dealt with at university as uh, very much within a kind of sh a foreshortened frame. Uh, I, I don't think the imminent demise of the planet as a, as, a, as, as a thing that can sustain humanity at large was ever much in our minds. What I've seen over 30 years of evolution is students taking a much, much bigger view, a view which in fact allows itself to, con to consider the terminal nature of our existence here. So uh, I think your generation has moved into a different way of thinking about these issues, that every research challenge should be addressed not only with a view to the immediate contingencies, the immediate problem you might wish to resolve, but to the bigger, the much bigger picture. And I think uh, uh, that is a really welcome change. It's been one of the most 
exciting things about being an educator for these years to see that change in the way in which people think about problems. And I think if, if research continues with a deeper and more profound sense of what that big picture means, uh, uh, we're, we're going to be in, in a very good place. Now, I'm going to just comment on the place of women in this in an enigmatic way. I'm going to just simply observe that that period has also seen the massive shift in the ratio of women to men in research and in education. It has been a remarkable transformation in which women have played a huge part. I didn't mean to give myself the last word. Go ahead then. Any, any more comments? No, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much for your answer. Right. Thanks very much. So, uh, everybody, thank you very much for, for the, the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Martin, Mr. Wilson. It's, uh, it's been, I, I hope, for everybody here uh, enlightening. Um, we have a gift for Mr. Martin. Um, would you care to come on over and, and uh, unveil this? Uh, this is a picture uh, by an Aboriginal artist from Tomogamy in Ontario. Uh, Benjamin Chi, and the title of the piece is Autumn Flight. Do I take this off? Yeah. Ooh, that's gorgeous. Nice. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. <laughs> this is also for you. <laughs> Where you go? It's a it's a clock. Aha! There you go. <laughs> Shall I open it? Sure. Go ahead. It's Christmas. <laughs> it's my birthday, but I've stopped counting. Can you can you just handle? Yeah. Let me do this. <laughs> Don't drop it. Oh, it's. Oh my. There you go. Thank you all very much. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I think you ought to run for public office, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Been there. <laughs>